Um, well, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, relational frame theory because um, well, it's not the point of my talk. Um, but but I would like to respond. Uh, Kelly, will you take the mic if you're going to walk around? And say sure, sure, I'll do that. Um, although I, I bet that I can be heard uh, without it. But I'll. I'll use Yes, yes, because it's almost your, is that coming out of there or no? there? There we go. Because it's your birthday or almost your birthday, I'll do almost anything you ask. <laughs> we just figured out, Sonia and I before this, somebody was trying to tell me how old she was, and I was like completely disbelieving it. I interviewed Sonia, I was a graduate student, very senior graduate student. Uh, Steve, Steve said, my time in Reno in graduate school spanned three decades. Oh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> my wife felt that way, too. Um, I came in 1989. I left in 2001. So technically, it was true. Some people are just harder to train than others. So um, as, as far as uh, uh, Paul's uh, assertion that relational frame theory doesn't have anything to do with acceptance and commitment therapy. Stephen Hayes' assertion. Okay. Paul asserts that Stephen Hayes said acceptance and commitment therapy doesn't have any relationship to relational frame theory. But um, the last time I, you know, checked on these things, um, you know, if I want to find out if there's a relationship between acceptance and commitment therapy and relational frame theory, I'm not going to go ask the guy who just said it's incomprehensible. So, you know, if you're interested in the relationship between acceptance and commitment therapy and relational frame theory, then um, uh, I would heartily recommend, unless you have extensive training in basic behavior analysis, then I would recommend Nicholas Tornike's uh, extraordinary uh, a good book on uh, relational frame theory. Why didn't you just explain it? To that, is, that is uh, uh, written uh, for clinicians. Um, so you could explain I, it to me. I could explain Cogan's theory in 30 seconds. Yes, you could. Yes, some, and some theories you can explain you know, very easily and very quickly with very little background um, in anything. And I think cognitive theory. Um, uh, is uh, relatively straightforward to explain because it's not really a terribly long distance from the ways that we, you know, that the culture just generally thinks about um, psychological phenomena. It's pretty close to lay psychology. It's more sophisticated, but it's fairly close to that and fairly easy to explain. Relational frame theory. Uh, in order to understand it at depth, requires a background in basic behavior analysis. And, you know, there are uh, books out there that are more uh, uh, friendly to people without that uh, background. Uh, written, and, and I mentioned Nicholas Tornike's book. Um, as far as it being incomprehensible, of course, that is a ridiculous idea because if it were truly incomprehensible, there would be, we wouldn't be talking about it, right? He wouldn't have asked a question about it. Uh, there wouldn't be many, many, many dozens of publications about it and experimental analyses uh, referring to it. So, like psychoanalysis. Um, uh, Paul, please. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I understand that this is challenging for you, but would you please oh, no, behave okay. yourself? <laughs> you know, really, behave. Hey, I wasn't, you know, uh, shouting comments at you no, during your talk. I, was I would like you, yeah, yeah, and when I call for questions, then I would take a question from you. But what you're doing right now is just rude. It's unseemly. And, and, you, and you did that the last time that we were in the same room together in the UK. And I will ask you to let me have my say. If it's incomprehensible, there wouldn't be anyone doing any research on it. And there are lots of people doing research on it. So clearly, someone understands it. And the last time I checked, the truth value of a theory was not measured by Paul Sulkowski's ability to understand.
understand it. And I'm not here to talk about relational friends. I'm here to talk about science strategy and about a particular science strategy that I'm interested in and a particular model of psychological functioning that I'm interested in. So let's go. Gosh, Paul, you got my heart down here. Maybe I'm in love. <laughs> or, or something. Of course, that's just an interpretation of my heart. <laughs> So how many people in this room would identify themselves primarily as working scientists? Okay, so there are a few people in the room who would count as their primary identity being working scientists. And how many, in the, how many people in the room um, uh, are working clinicians or are in training to be working clinicians? So the majority of the audience, um, and I, I count myself as both, um, the majority of the audience is, uh, are, are, are clinicians, and so uh, it's particularly my hope uh, to give a talk that um, helps you to understand um, what I think uh, science is. So lots of people uh, uh, think of science as sort of a cold and removed somehow. I think science is a public trust. See, Science is an instrument to solve human problems. It's kind of a, a crucible, a, a, a cradle, a place that we can sort of hold human problems and examine them in ways that um, non-scientific methods can. Now, I don't mean that non-scientific methods aren't important and valuable methods, but scientific methods have some, some very special qualities uh, that they can offer us. So I'm hoping to uh, talk to you a little bit about a science that, that you could uh, love. But which science? Now, I want to say just a word or two about what it is that we are up against here, because we are up against a uh, 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 Sisyphean uh, task. We have a stone to push up the hill, and it's multiple, but Certainly, I would count among them things like the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which, uh, and, and I don't feel much differently about uh, the ICD, um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which I would argue um, is uh, not only uh, not good uh, for the development of our understanding of human uh, su uh, psychological suffering, but is, in fact, uh, been a destructive force uh, in the understanding of human psychological function. Now, I know a lot of people uh, want to argue, but we have to have something uh, in order to develop effective treatment. And the, the thing that I like to point out is that if you look at our most effective treatments, like if you look at the best empirically supported treatments that we have, Every single one of those treatments was developed prior to us beginning to use that diagnostic manual. We didn't even start to use the DSM until DSM-3. And by that point in time, cognitive therapy was well developed, cognitive behavior therapy was developed, behavior therapy was developed, or exposure-based treatments were developed. All of these central uh, uh, technologies, all of our best supported treatments were developed before we used that manual. So the assertion that we need that manual in order to move forward, uh, I would say, uh, show me the data. Show me the acceleration in our effectiveness in treating these things and the development of new treatments uh, since uh, the adoption of this manual. Um, and if you're hopeful about the next DSM, good luck with that. Uh, an, an additional uh, issue, and it's related to the DSM, is uh, the 
I think, pernicious sort of force exerted by big pharma uh, in healthcare. Uh, there is a, uh, a lust for profits that seems to know no bounds. And um, uh, one uh, uh, exercise that you can do, if you think that I'm being uh, hyperbolic here, um, look up uh, all of the major atypical antipsychotic drugs and find the parent company that markets that drug and then do a Google search that uses that company name and uh, criminal and civil lawsuits against those companies. And you won't find a single manufacturer of a, a modern atypical antipsychotic drug that has not been successfully sued in the uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, for criminal uh, marketing of these uh, drugs. Last year, 2012, Big Pharma paid uh, nearly seven billion dollars, nearly seven billion dollars in uh, uh, fines and fees uh, for both civil and criminal penalties in the marketing uh, of these uh, drugs. All of this is part of uh, the sort of medicalization, I would say, of human psychological suffering. Part of, I, I believe, an obstacle that we uh, face in understanding psychological phenomena is uh, the sort of fight against this overextended uh, medical metaphor. So we've got this sort of metaphor that looks something like uh, depression and anxiety are like the equivalent of like cancer uh, or some kind of infection and uh, uh, our medications uh, are designed to correct uh, uh, those uh, uh, medical illnesses. Now it's worth pointing out that we don't have, uh, after uh, many decades of pursuit, we don't have a single sensitive and specific biological marker for any major psychiatric disorder. Not one. Uh, can you go and get a blood test and find out, oh, I've got schizophrenia, or oh, I've got you know, obsessive compulsive disorder. Now, it's an incredibly ironic thing, because prior to 1980, when we were busy uh, developing things like behavior therapy, cognitive behavior therapy, cognitive therapy or exposure-based therapies, when we were developing those things, uh, there, was, uh, there were theories of psychological suffering that existed, and there were a variety of them. There was you know, Beck's uh, core cognitive hypotheses. There were uh, a variety of different behavioral analyses. And we were on our way to uh, creating theories of human psychological suffering. And I think that the adoption of the DSM uh, uh, interfered with that. And we entered a period of time where we considered our psychological treatments not unlike the uh, uh, pharmacological treatments uh, as a sort of equivalent. And you know, you could see that we started off with uh, fewer than 100 uh, disorders with DSM-1. You know, now we're up to uh, something like 300. Uh, there was just an article um, in one of the major uh, U.S. financial papers uh, about the potential for sort of cash in uh, on the new diagnoses that we'll see in DSM-5. This is what the model uh, looks like and what was attempted at the National Institutes of Mental Health, what was uh, uh, what they attempted to get the National Institutes of Mental Health to do. Something like this. So we have our happy clinician here, and he has a defiant child, and the way to treat this defiant child, um, this is not a problem because he's got the prescription. See, he's got his defiant child uh, treatment protocol. So you take the disorder, and you put the disorder with the uh, medicine, and uh, you get a cure. Isn't that great? Look how happy that clinician is. Except the thing is, see, he's got more than one kind of client. He doesn't just have defiant children. He's also got ones with ADHD and uh, 
you know, adult ADHD, but that's okay because he's got prescriptions for all of them also. Isn't that great? Except he's actually got more kinds of clients than that, and really even more kinds of clients than that. But he's strong. I mean, this is the situation that we're in, and a lot of times what you'll hear scientists basically say is, we've got these empirically supported treatments, and if you all would use the empirically supported treatments, you know, that we uh, have developed, then the whole world of mental health would just be, you know, a happy and better place. Uh, except the problem is, you don't have big enough bookshelves, you know, to hold, uh, you know, 400, uh, uh, you know, treatment protocols for 400 different psychological disorders. You don't have enough money or enough time to go to enough workshops to learn uh, that extraordinary array uh, of, of treatments available. This is sort of the prescription model of mental health. Now I want to offer, and I turn to Pat, and, and actually a great deal of what Paul had to say, I'm uh, very much uh, in agreement with. Uh, and I think if the battle for understanding human psychological suffering uh, were between you know, people like me and people like Paul, um, that this work would move ahead um, uh, much more quickly. Because we're both interested in psychological theories of you know, how human suffering uh, occurs, and we're both interested in theories that have sufficient breadth to help us understand lots of different kinds of psychological suffering. Before I talk about my own particular interest in this area and the kinds of theoretical and treatment development work that I'm doing, uh, I want to start with this kind of basic idea of, you know, how do we know the difference between a good theory and a poor theory, right? How do we even evaluate theories? And I started my talk with this, but which science, right? Um, usually, I think people think that the difference between a good theory and a poor theory is that good theories are true and poor theories are false. Um, and I would like to uh, assert that um, that is not the difference between good and uh, uh, good theories and poor theories. So what is the difference between a good theory and a poor theory? Well, one thing I would point out is lots and lots of things are true uh, that are not good scientific theories. Lots of things. So imagine, uh, imagine a man is dying. He's laying on his deathbed. And his lover is there with him, and she can see that he is dying. And he looks up into her eyes, and he can see the sadness there at his loss. And he says to her, that time of year thou mayst in me behold, when yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold. There ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. Now, I don't know what you think, but I think that's true. I think that's extraordinarily true. It's true of human experience. It's true of loss. Uh, it's true uh, uh, to the experience of communicating, you know, my understanding uh, of your experience of loss. But, so far, no one has ever figured out how to turn Shakespeare into a good experimental science. So lots of things are true, but not useful uh, as scientific theories. So how about here? Right? People might say, well, Beck's theory is the true theory because Beck's theory makes sense, and Freud's theory is goofy. Well. We can't sort scientific theories according to whether they make sense or not. It's an improper sorting tool. But here's why. Lots and lots of things make sense, but they're false. Right? Here's something that makes sense. The Earth is flat. Just go look out the window and show me the round part. 
right? The Earth is flat, and I've been to lots of places on the Earth in the last year, you know. I'll be in Australia pretty soon. I've been there before. I promise you that the Earth is flat there. It's flat uh, in France. It's flat in England. In Holland, it's incredibly flat. You could stand on a box and see all the way across that country. The Earth is flat, and isn't it also obvious that if the Earth were actually round, that the people in Australia would fall off, <laughs> right? Now, it turns out that, you know, this thing that makes perfect sense, that the Earth is flat, and I'm sure the smartest human beings on the planet, uh, you know, at one time, thought that the Earth was flat, but science gives us way, uh, ways to examine phenomena that allow us to see uh, not just if something makes sense, but whether it's true or not. And sometimes things that sound really, really goofy are actually true. Uh, by this light, creation science, for example, which is a kind of a hot topic in the United States, and they say, well, we should teach creation science uh, right along evolutionary science uh, in our schools. I would say we should not do that. Why? Because uh, the critics of creation science say, Creation science is not really science because it's goofy. You know, it doesn't make any sense. God created the earth, 